the 48 million uninsured in the country, they're not a monolithic mass. And they, they did a study that showed like six distinct groups, the, the healthy and young comprising 48% of the uninsured, the sick, active and worried, 29% of the uninsured, and the passive and unengaged, 15%. So, it, it, it's it, you know, when you're trying to do a marketing plan, too, it's how do you reach all of those groups, right? They're saying uh, this particular analysis is saying the healthy and young take good health for granted. They're tech savvy and have low motivation to enroll. The sick, active and worried are mostly Gen X and baby boomers, active seekers of healthcare information and worried about costs. The passive and unengaged, uh, unengaged, mostly 49 and older, lives for today, doesn't understand much about health insurance. So the, the challenge, like they're saying, for the administration is to sign up a lot of the young and healthy as well as the passive and unengaged, right, to offset higher costs. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a big marketing challenge in terms of how to talk to people in a way that resonates with them. Um, and that, that's something that was a challenge during the campaign as well, because when you tell people horror stories about the health insurance industry, it, they don't, they don't want to be they don't want to be scared in that way, right? Those horror stories don't resonate. What you have to do is get people angry and fired up, right? Nobody ever said, I'm scared as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Right. So people, you have to get people fired up and, and motivated. And I, and I think the good thing about this, and, and I use good uh, in, in a very modified way, is that everybody becomes a different kind of healthcare consumer once they're faced with some sort of healthcare problem, and we all do eventually. Well, let's yeah, and let's talk about just so people know what what the time frame is. So, uninsured uh, Americans will be able to sign up for the uh, subsidized private health plans through new insurance markets in their state starting October first, right? Right. October is when the online signups will be available. You'll start to to be able to comparison shop online and see what's available in your area and what the costs are, what the benefits are, what looks best for you. So then coverage under the law takes effect January 1st. That's also the legal requirement that most Americans carry health insurance goes into force. That's when they, they have to stop uh, discriminating, right, against people with pre-existing, pre-existing conditions. conditions right. yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and what they're saying is the new law obviously mainly geared to the uninsured people who buy coverage directly, right, from insurance companies. Most people that have their uh, insurance through uh, employer plans aren't going to be affected, right? Right. I mean, that's a big thing to keep in mind as we talk about all of this. We're a very large company, and 95% of people get their health insurance through work. It's only if you haven't had a job that's offered you health insurance have you really had to navigate this on your own. And that's when it becomes, I mean, when we talk about the people who are active seekers of information, they're usually people who either are uh, self-employed or freelancers or you know, people who are part-time workers who aren't offered insurance through their job, but a majority of Americans don't even understand how difficult the system is because their employers take care of it for them. And they may not pay the full bill, but they handle all the administrative work that comes along with finding a plan and navigating the issues involved with buying health insurance. So I think a lot of people don't understand just how complicated and manipulative the insurance industry can be. And and that's why it affects different portions of the population in different ways. Right, and you've said that before about blame the right people. You know, blame the insurance companies because there's the they're the ones we talked. There was a story last week. Remember about. Um Insurers are going to have to have to pay an average of 32 percent more for medical claims, blah blah blah. And we talked about the actuary study, all that stuff, right? Oh yes, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, the, the idea is the insurance companies are complaining that once they have to take everybody, they're going to have to end up paying more because sicker people are going to be in the pool, and that's going to make everything more expensive for them. Never mind the fact that they make record profits year after year after year, right. uh, and what they could do is actually uh, spend more money on health care as opposed to buying back their own stock and padding their their pockets and and inflating their salaries and that sort of thing. But um, this is Kamal Freeman here at We Act Radio, fourteen eighty AM and WeActRadio dot com, WPWC, bringing you a delayed broadcast of Clearing the Fog, already in progress. Hi, I'm Tom Morello. Some call me the Night Watchman. In the case of Mumia Bujamal is at a crucial stage. Please go to freemumia.com to find out more information about how you can help Mumia Bujamal and other political prisoners. Night Watchman out. Stay tuned to We Act Radio, Washington, D.C.'s only independent radio station. Catch us online at weactradio.com.
they were saying when they think you cannot hear If you understood what they do, if for you it was so clear If you knew they shut down the factory in an economic ruse If you could kiss the cheek of the child in the sweatshop that made your shoes Every time we went to war to fight our evil foes They told you we were really fighting for the good of CEOs If you could feel the hunger of the many, see the riches of the few If they told it like it is, what if you knew? And Kevin Zeese, welcome to the show. That was David Rovick singing What If You Knew. What, and that's and what we're here to tell you. What exactly. If, the truth so you can get through the fog, which is the forces of greed. That's right. Today we have a great show, but as usual, we want to start with a little bit of news. Do you want to tell about the women that are walking the Mississippi yeah, very, River? Very inspiring. These uh, Native American Indians uh, who have started at the head, headwaters of the Mississippi, and they have took some water from there and are right. carrying it down to the bottom of the Mississippi River, 1,200 miles. They're marching the whole way. They're en route now. And their goal is to raise awareness to protect the river for the next seven generations. Right. They're planning to take the pure water from That's the headwaters right. of the Mississippi and uh, dump it into where the Mississippi hits the Gulf of Mexico to show the Mississippi River um, what she could be like. What she could be like. Yeah. It's just beautiful. We have an article about it on the Occupy Washington, D.C., org website with lots of pictures of them they're marching through snow at times and having ceremonies along the way it's really inspiring and there's some real changes going on with uh, the keystone xl pipeline Why don't you tell about that? yeah well for one thing you know there have been a number of spills uh in the past week which is it's not good news that's happening, isn't it? yeah minnesota <laughs> east texas arkansas um but we received a report this morning that a french company total that owned 49 percent of the investment in the tar sands project is actually pulling out at a 1.65 billion dollar Law, loss selling it to the canadian company they don't Suncor. see the profit margins well they see the prices are falling that things are delayed they're having trouble getting labor that they would have to invest another five billion dollars over five years and they don't see where that makes economic sense and what this shows me is that the protest the resistance can make a difference the prices are already not making a big profit right if blockaders get out there and do their job we could stop this this continue blockade. right but you know stopping is not enough because uh, uh we had one of the spills was a train spill right Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett owns Union Pacific, and he guaranteed the president that if the pipeline didn't go through, he would transport the crude. Um, and we had on a tra train. We had a crude. Uh, excuse me, a tar sand spill yeah. uh, from one of his trains. And right. I think people should start holding Buffett accountable. Absolutely. Warren Buffett has spends a lot of money on his image. He comes across as this good guy. He wants to be taxed as much as his secretary and all right. this nonsense. But he's he he really funds a lot of evil stuff, including this tar sands effort. Right. Right. And he needs to be called out for it. I hope people hold him accountable. And that brings us into our first guest. Our first who guest is an who expert. likes to hold people accountable. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're so excited to have with us this morning Bill Black. He's the author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One and an associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He spent years working on regulatory policy and fraud prevention as executive director of the Institute for Fraud Prevention, litigation director of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, and deputy director of the National Commission on Financial Institution Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement, among other positions, we'll have his full bio on our website, clearingthefogradio.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at ClearFog Media. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I read your writing all the time. Absolutely. I read your blog all the time and watch you on Real News regularly. So really looking forward to this conversation. Let me start with a big picture question. Um, you've written about how widespread the securities fraud was, saying our most prestigious banks were involved in research. You've highlighted research that shows our most, quote, reputable financial institutions were involved. You write about liar loans and fraudulent mortgage loans with false incomes and false appraisals that inflate the value of the housing market and really were the root of the housing bubble collapse. How do you think the federal government is responding to it? How is the FDIC, the SEC, and the Department of Justice responding to this incredible widespread uh, fraudulent security activity by our most, quote, prestigious banks? Well, we uh, <laughs> developed the phrase uh, too big to prosecute right. as a way to ridicule the failure to respond, only to have them adopt the concept of too big to prosecute as a official policy. Right. So it's, it's dangerous even to ridicule these people because they're not possible to shame them. And so what have been the shortcomings? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the FDIC, for example, uh, not been doing in the SEC? What, 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 what should they be doing that they're not doing? Well, what people 
tend to forget is that we have a, roughly a million people working in our criminal justice system. And of those million people, on a really good day, and we have very few good days, <laughs> we have 2,500 who look for elite white-collar crimes, the CFBI white-collar specialists. We have over 1,300 industries in the United States, so we have fewer than two FBI agents per industry, not per corporation. Wow, per industry. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously they don't know anything about the industries typically. Right. They can't possibly have expertise. And obviously they don't walk a beat. So the only way they're able to come is if somebody does a criminal referral. Mm -hmm. And, you know, newsflash, corporations, and particularly big banks, don't do criminal referrals against their own CEOs. Right. Yeah. Uh, episodically, you get whistleblowers, but uh, companies have gotten very good at crushing whistleblowers as well. So you absolutely need the banking regulatory agencies to make the criminal referrals. Back in the day, in the savings and loan crisis, which was less than one eightieth the size, mm -hmm. both in terms of losses and criminality, uh, our agency, uh, which was then called the Office of Thrift Supervision, made over thirty thousand criminal referrals. Wow. Thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. Wow. wow. This produced over a thousand felony convictions just in cases designated as major by the FBI. So these are the elites, and that understates the degree of prioritization because we created the top 100 list of the worst frauds, mm -hmm. which was roughly 300 institutions and about 600 individuals. Wow. Virtually all of them were prosecuted, and we had a 90% conviction rate against the most elite frauds. Well, flash forward to this crisis, which again is at least 80 times worse. Mm -hmm. And the fraud is 80 times worse. Actually, it's much more than 80 times worse. The same agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, which was supposed to, by the way, regulate countrywide and Washington Mutual and IndyMac, all these fraudulent, and AIG, all mm -hmm. these fraudulent places, made zero criminal referrals. Zero. Zero. The even though the fraud is documented. Yeah. And it seems like the fraud, that's what the market just said, that even though the fraud is documented, because it seems like we've seen reports from the uh, Levin's uh, committee in the, in the Senate, and we've seen media reports that pretty well document the fraud. I mean, are, are there cases that he made? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, but again, if you don't make the referral, it never happens. And referrals have been ended. Hmm not limited, wow. not reduced, essentially ended. So and those referrals have to come from a government agency? Well, it's a practical matter, because who else is going to do them? As I say, episodically, you'll get some for whistleblowers, but if uh, your uh, listeners listen to the Frontline or watch the Frontline report, the Untouchables, you'll see that the Justice Department doesn't even follow up, uh, and that the news reporters were able to find all these whistleblower types who had information, and they reported that they had never even been contacted by the FBI. So, you know, here's the easy test. Have you ever heard the head of the FBI or the head of the criminal division or the U.S. attorney or the attorney general of the United States of America make a plea for whistleblowers to come forward again <laughs> the big financial quite the opposite no, in fact the, uh, you, yeah. Lenny Bauer the head of the criminal pro potential prosecutions there uh, explained to, on the, in the media why there were no prosecutions and there were not going to be any prosecutions and he left the job Got now he's nice getting job. four million dollars a year from Covington and Burling right you know, I, I see those things as payoffs <laughs> and maybe, maybe four million for defending elite white collar criminals and keeping them from ever being prosecuted yeah. right Right. So the revolving door basically has now been, you know, supercharged uh, mm -hmm. and such. And the payoffs are handsome and they're very quick. Uh, and, and, of course, it looks good on his resume as well. Now, before we go on to the economic issues that we're facing today, I want to get a little more about this. Now, if you don't have prosecutions, if you don't have right. uh, people held accountable, what's the impact of that on the financial system? Well, according to conservative economists, if you don't... Uh, deter them, you'll get massively more crime. 
star. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> Deterrence. Oh, yeah, they, they use that in marijuana cases, I think. <laughs> yeah, they use that everywhere. You know, and school uh, behavior. Yeah. All these conservatives, uh, the only thing they've ever heard of in criminology, uh, and I'm a white-collar criminologist, is broken windows theory, right? right? So broken windows is their excuse for uh, arresting uh, very poor people, particularly minorities, uh, in mass arrests, mm-hmm. because they say we've got to uh, prevent even the most trivial thing has to be criminalized. You know, the squeegee guys and such. We need to lock them up right. uh, because otherwise the world will fall apart. Well, what happens when they get to the white collar sphere? Right. <laughs> in the white collar sphere, the theory would actually work where it doesn't work in the blue collar sphere uh, if you did it. But that's the one place in the world they never do it. Right? They they not only have broken windows, they have broken financial institutions, broken countries uh, all through Europe. So, so the consequences of that on you know it hurts the working and middle class. As, you well, know. it hurts the whole economy. I mean, yeah. I mean it yeah. creates a creates a kind of mafia mafia capitalism. Net. Yeah, creates a mafia capitalism. Absolutely. That, uh, allows so, by 2006, to give you an idea of scope, 40 percent of all the loans made that year were liars' loans. Now, again, 80%. that should be something of a hint when the industry calls them liars' loans. Mm-hmm. That's their term. And that was two years before the financial. That was collapse. their term. That's wow, right. That's their term. Um, so that's over two million fraudulent loans. The in, we have studies that show the incidence of fraud in liars' loans is ninety percent. All right, wow. so that means over two million fraudulent mortgage loans in two thousand six alone, yeah. and these fraudulent loans grew by over five hundred percent between two thousand three in 2006. In other words, these are the loans that hyperinflated the bubble. People still often call this the subprime crisis, but by 2006, half of all the loans called subprime were also liar's loans. The, the categories are not mutually exclusive. And studies have shown repeatedly that it was overwhelmingly the lenders who put the lies in liars. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. I mean, because a lot of people blame the consumers. Yeah, but it, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there's great testimony. Uh, people could read this online, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, about how the uh, loan officers and brokers were trained because they have the head of training right? Mm -hmm. The head of training uh, for much of the nation who went around doing road shows, doing all this training, uh, explains how he taught them that the quality of the loans, the fact that the loan would default, the fact that the loan was completely unsuitable for the consumer were all irrelevant. Wow. That frequently the prior job of the loan brokers was flipping burgers. So they went wow. from flipping burgers to flipping homes. <laughs> now here's the real kicker. Oh my god. So gosh. as a you know, flipping the burger, you could make around twenty thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. For a single what we call jumbo, that just means, you know, somewhere in the range of six hundred thousand dollar house. Expensive but not rare in California right. or D C for that right. matter. Uh, your fee as the loan broker. Remember, you're the smallest person in this chain, so you can imagine what the fees are elsewhere. Your fee could be twenty thousand wow. dollars for arranging one of these loans. A lot of incentive. Yes. But you only get the fee if the loan is approved. Right. And then they get their fees only if the loan is successfully sold. Wow. So what are you going to do? You're going to make sure that the borrower's income is inflated. In fact, that same study that found fraud incidents was 90%, mm-hmm. found that in uh, 60% of the cases, the borrower's income was inflated by at least 50%. Oh wow. Well, we have to take a quick break. We have a song um, in honor of Bill's book. Absolutely. Hit Bill's book, which is the best way to rob a bank is if you own one, right? right. Um, this is called Steal Like a Billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steal like a billionaire Stuff my pockets with a golden chest I walk around in a pinstripe suit I get away with all that loot And I'll never have to worry about paying my rent I get a job with the president, oh yeah It's time I get my share I'm gonna steal like a billionaire 
You're listening to We At Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at WEAC Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit the Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org, or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. June 27th is National HIV Testing Day. HIV testing is fast, painless, and often free. I've been tested for HIV. I've been tested for HIV. Have you? To find an HIV testing center near you, visit greaterthan.org. If you're caught with an ounce of cocaine, the chances are good you're going to go to jail. If it happens repeatedly, you may go to jail for the rest of your life. But evidently, if you launder nearly a billion dollars, for drug cartels and violate our international sanctions, your company pays a fine and you go home and sleep in your own bed at night, every single individual associated with this. And I just, I think that's fundamentally wrong. Hi, this is Chris Hedges. Uh, and when I'm in Washington, I don't want my news filtered through corporate sponsors. I want to hear the truth, which is why I listen to DC's only independent radio station, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WP, WC, Washington's progressive working community. We Act Radio, do something. I want to see you like a big idea, set the beats and gangsters at the bank. I should have made those pirates walk the land. You're listening to Clearing the Fog, speaking truth to expose the forces of greed with Margaret Flowers. And Kevin Zeese, we're it, talking to Bill Black. That's right. And uh, in the first segment of the show, we were talking about a lot of the fraud and corruption that goes on and the fact that um, everything is criminalized except white-collar crime. And we write about that in our article, which will be coming out this Wednesday on Truth Out. Yeah, last week's show was on the criminal injustice system, and now we have an article coming out about that show. We'll do an article about this show, too, next week. Absolutely. Uh, That's right. So, Bill, you write, we've been strangling the economic recovery through economic incompetence, and you criticize President Obama for his push to austerity. Can you tell us more about that? How do you think the government should be responding to the crisis? Well, uh, we've known for at least 75 years that if you have a great recession, you have insufficient demand. If you have insufficient demand, the companies don't make things because people aren't buying things, so they don't hire people. So you have lots of unemployment. So the answer is to provide the demand. And uh, for 70 years of those 75 years, there's been a complete consensus on this among economists. And we've created what we call the automatic stabilizers, Mm -hmm. uh, which automatically reduce tax revenues during a recession and increase expenditures. And the result has been that we have fewer recessions, that they're less severe, and that uh, we recover more quickly from them. And uh, under Republican presidents, we always uh, avoid austerity in the modern era. Mm -hmm. They're really big believers in Keynesian economics when they're in power. But suddenly, when Democrats get in power, Everything we know in economics, everything the Republicans do when they're in fact in power, gets reversed. And then, bizarrely, we have a whole huge wing of the Democratic Party. This is the uh, Bob Rubin wing of the Democratic Mm -hmm. Party that has been so influential. That uh, is the finance wing of the Democratic Party, right? This is Wall Street on the Potomac. And they love austerity. Now, this is... always crazy, but it's particularly crazy because we just have to look across the Atlantic Ocean uh, at the Eurozone, which has followed this official policy 
of austerity and has created a second gratuitous recession that there was no reason to have. Uh, and it isn't just a recession in places like Greece and Spain and Italy. They're talking about Great Depression levels of yeah. unemployment. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. unemployment is over 50% in two of those countries and over 36% in Italy. And mm-hmm. so in Ireland, for example, where I've been, the sick old joke is true again, and that is what is the leading export of Ireland? Well, it's the Irish people. Yeah, I was a, yeah. You know, it's interesting you call it the Reuben um, uh, Walt, uh, wing of the party because really it's the Clinton-Obama wing. I, I would say, I mean, President Obama in particular – has been pushing this grand bargain. I mean, you wrote about this, Margaret, uh, for, was it Al Jazeera? Al Jazeera, in English, yeah. Uh, about, and about how he over and over, and I think he's on his fourth try now, to right. whether it's a super committee or the debt commission or the uh, negotiations with Boehner. big fiscal he's, cliff scare. The fiscal yeah. cliff stuff. I mean, now he's, he's still pushing this grand bargain. You call it a, uh, a grand betrayal. Uh, and, you know, what, what's your thoughts on if the grand bargain is put in effect? And, 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 you know, first off, why is Obama doing it? It makes no sense. And then, you know, what's the effect if it gets put, put in place? Well, it is. Um, Bob Rubin, of place. course, is the common denominator. Yes, that's true. Clinton, uh, and Obama. And the guy they look to for their very pro Wall Street uh, orientation. Yeah, and Obama has a lot of Rubin disciples in his administration. You're right about that. And a lot of Wall Street executives in his yep. administration. Yep. Yeah. All over the place, including yeah. the Justice Department, uh, which is uh, therefore, as you said, become the injustice. Uh, department pretty uh, officially. So, uh, why? Uh, for the worst of all reasons, uh, ego. Uh, he sees this, and, and by the way, this is a sort of semi-official leaks from his own administration. This is not critics. Uh, he sees this as his place in history. Mm. And he sees the fact that he is going against his own party and the things that uh, you know, his party has done best. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps. These are all the most successful, most popular programs. He sees that his willingness to betray those demonstrates that uh, he is different. And, uh, you know, sort of back to McCain-like maverick uh, type of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, he seems to realize that the Nobel Prize he got was a joke. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. But, so, you know, he also has expressed admiration for Reagan, and uh, he, so I think he believes this stuff. Right. Uh, it's, well, it's hard to know what he believes. It is. As a senator, he actually did have a pretty liberal voting record. Um, but mm. uh, the way he became president, of course, was the first you have to win the nomination of your party. And people tend to forget that was an impossible mission to beat Hillary, right, who had all the funding. And the way uh, then Senator Obama did it, uh, his key financing came all overwhelmingly. That's right. Uh, from big finance. finance. Goldman Sachs. Yep. Yeah. And the health Well, not health just Goldman Sachs. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan uh, Chase also is big. big. The health insurance industry is big. Well, that was another thing. You had a program on earlier, but that was the really, um, you know, they saw it as realistic politics, but uh, they made the deal. I mean, they openly made the deal with the private insurers uh, to get Obamacare, and, and the private insurers are the problem. That's right, 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 absolutely. You know, one thing that's really confused, I don't know if you want to ask about this. No, you can ask. Uh, one thing that's really confused in our media and in our public discourse is this question of if we don't, Put in place, Australia will be like Greece, or uh, or <laughs> be a know, responsible your family. family. Your family would be cutting their budget if they were going through a, a job loss. And people make these comparisons. What's the difference in the United States? Because we have a sovereign currency. Why does it make that? Why does that make a difference? Okay, so yeah, this is the uh, thing that drives all economists crazy. Drives me nuts. <laughs> um, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> it's, it's understandable for regular folks, but because what do we know? we know our household. And so if we just extrapolate from our own household, this is the answer we get. But, you know, no economist or anybody who studied economics has this excuse. So what happens if all of us, uh, because that's closer to what a nation is, responded to a recession 
by firing ourselves <laughs> <laughs> and cutting back our spending. When right. there's already insufficient spending, that's why we have a recession. <laughs> you get a vastly greater recession, right? And I don't even understand why the household metaphor business people often use it. I know. You hear them as corporations saying, oh, we must eliminate all corporate debt. See that that happening anywhere? Yeah, yeah, right. No, they love leverage. Leverage is debt. (laughs) And so why is is a sovereign currency nation different? Well, sovereign uh, currency nation, as long as it borrows in its own currency uh, and um, has freely floating exchange rates, cannot be forced to default, unless, of course, they have Republicans in the House. (laughs) 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 <laughs> but there's no economic reason why you would default. There's right. no moral reason why you would default. We could easily pay our debts, and we should, uh, and such. Uh, so we're nothing like uh, a household, and we're not, uh, you know, an entity with a lifespan of 50 to 80 years. Uh, the United States has uh, not had a deficit, I think, for something like eight years in its history. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not had a debt. Right. Not had a deficit for, you know, something like 25 years in mm-hmm. its entire history. And we became uh, the most powerful economic nation in the world, uh, in large part because we did borrow <laughs> and such. So um, th- this stuff is, is just all sort of craziness. There's some really good stuff. Uh, by my colleagues who specialize in this on our uh, website, New Economic Perspectives. Yes, mm-hmm. great website. Uh, that explains this. We link to that on our, our economic page, which is it's our economy.us. That's right. We That's think right. you guys do great work. But what's interesting to me is that um, I know we wrote about this in one of our newsletters that the British Empire carried a deficit that was like 100 to 200%, 200 up as high as 200% of their GDP. Yeah. And that they were able to manage that and get through that. And also the fact that we're already printing $85 billion a month of new money, uh, but it's QE. all going into, right. into the big banks. Right, right. So, it just oh. seems like we're printing money and putting it in the wrong place. Yeah. Well, yes, if you wanted to have real stimulus. Now, here, in, in slight defense of Obama, um, the stimulus bill that was introduced was way too small. Right. Yeah. Economists said that from the beginning. But it was much better than the stimulus bill that was adopted. And the stimulus bill that was proposed was also very bad in terms of, again, some of this... Too much tax-based. Yes, it's yeah. tax cut-based. But the, the key was uh, it did have a revenue-sharing comparison. Uh, Very important. We don't do enough of that. Yeah, so sharing with everybody the states, yeah. knew that there was a disaster coming in state and local government because they don't have sovereign currencies. Right. They can't borrow extensively uh, beyond their, you know, so... Um, everybody knew there'd be disaster there. They'd have to uh, fire uh, lots of people. They'd have to cut back government services when those government services were most needed. Mm -hmm. Now, that's nuts, right? That just makes the recession and the misery of the recession far worse. And so there was this good Republican idea, revenue sharing, where the federal government would uh, transfer a fair chunk of cash to the states to dramatically reduce these kinds of layoffs. Mm -hmm. And if that had been done, unemployment would be substantially lower in the United States of America. And, of course, a lot of those vital services would still be provided. And instead, not just Republicans, but uh, conservative uh, Democrats, the blue dogs, uh, they got together to kill the revenue-sharing portion. And President Obama, frankly, didn't fight very hard. Uh, to keep it alive. So it, it, it all died within actually right. days of the opposition. So that brings us to, and we should ask this quickly because we have to take another break, who benefits when the deficit is reduced? Well, actually not that many people, period. Uh, it's a really terrible strategy that hurts almost everybody. Uh, and that's why it's particularly crazed. Uh, but does it help the, ri- the richest? Not necessarily. I mean, mm. an economic recovery is often pretty darn good for the rich uh, as well. So, no, this is not mostly some 
grand uh, secret plan to make somebody wealthy. It's just uh, the triumph of dogma over I I intelligence. Over but isn't, 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 isn't fear of inflation, even though I don't think there's any legitimate reason to be afraid of right now, but isn't that what drives it? The, the people who have money don't want to see their money worth less? Well, their money is worth less if they get a lower return and such as well. And right. with a better economy, they can tend to get a higher return. I mean, again, the stock market doesn't track the real world economy all that well, as we've just seen. Right. Where we have the stack record stock, uh, you know, recovery. But again, that uh, we have a far better recovery than does Europe uh, because we haven't had austerities. That's why our stock market is done better than theirs. You know, it's interesting. I think the recovery, you, may, you said you were defending Obama with his uh, inefficient, in, ineffective and uh, uh, inadequately sized stimulus. stimulus. In many reflects, the, re the so-called recovery we're going through reflects the inadequacy of that stimulus. Right. If, you, oh, if you'd done a proper right. stimulus, we'd have a much more robust. Right. Now we need to take a quick we break. We have to take a break. When we come back, Bill, I want to we want to ask you something that I haven't heard you write about. So I want to mention it before the break, and people can listen to it and think about it, and you know, I want you to think about it. What would a, a good finance system look like? What would the Fed's role be? What would, uh, uh, would the big banks be broken up? Would there be nationalized banks? Would there community banks and credit unions, how they fit into the whole thing? Uh, you know, what, what, what would a, a, a people's finance system look like? And we'll get back to that when we come back from this break. Right. We'll take a quick break. Some people get paid for robbing us blind. Spending our money, have a hell of a time. Getting bailed out by Congress so they never fail. Making us wonder why they're all not in jail. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. This is Kimon Freeman, host of Speak Easy and co-founder of We Act Radio. Suicide is a very serious problem in today's challenging world, whether with our troops abroad or with everyday citizens within our own society. Before you take your life into your own hands, tie a knot at the end of your rope and call the suicide hotline toll-free at 1-855-320-LIFE. That's 1-855-320-LIFE. It may just be the most important call you ever make. You talk, we listen, and together we survive. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going. Up. I speak from Pennsylvania's death row. A bright, shiny, highly mechanized hell. Mumia Abu Jamal is one of the lost souls of the revolution. And they're trying to figure out how to shut him down entirely. They have moved heaven and earth to stop his voice being heard in the United States. When you talk about groups that are maligned and slurred as terrorists in the major media, they're really uh, small fry. They're retail terrorists, wholesale terrorists of the United States government. The whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to. On a move, this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. Hi, I'm Tom Morello. Some call me the Night Watchman. In the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, is at a crucial stage. Please go to freemumia.com to find out more information about how you can help Mumia Abu Jamal and other political prisoners. Night Watchman out. You're listening to We At Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. Have you heard this joke? It's funny uh -huh. about a system out of whack. How the banks all took our money, and now we're trying to get it back. Trying to get it back. But the banks back. all dragged their heels, just like we knew they would. It's time that we got real. Time for Robin Hood. Yeah, time for Robin Hood. You're listening to Clearing the Fog, speaking truth to expose the forces of greed with Margaret Flowers. And Kevin Zeeson, we're talking to Bill Black. Uh, first segment, we talked about the inadequate response of the enforcement authorities in the federal government. Right. Then we talked about the inadequate response to the economic uh, collapse. At the federal level, that's right. And uh, we're going to now get into, I think, I hope it'll be an interesting discussion. I've never heard Bill's views on him, so I'm very curious. You know, the finance system's not working for us. 
uh, what would work. Right. Bill? So there are three critical interrelated uh, things, and all of them come from these systemically dangerous institutions, the SDIs, um, which, of course, the government insists on calling systemically important. But the Mm -hmm. real concept is that they are dangerous, that the government believes that when the next one, not if, when the next one fails. These are the too big to bank fail, big, big, big to fails, and too big to, to jail banks. Too big to prosecute, too big to regulate, too big to manage. Okay. Right? So three related disasters that mean that we have to uh, shrink these things to the point where they no longer pose a systemic risk. First thing is that you inherently get a huge subsidy, implicit subsidy, if you're a systemically dangerous institution. And that means you crush any competition. That means competition doesn't exist. Free markets don't exist uh, in this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so anybody that wants the markets or believes in markets or believes in competition should join us in breaking up the big banks. Second thing, they become too big to prosecute. Not really, but you know, you put leadership in charge that will uh, take that position. And that means that you destroy integrity. You destroy the entire concept of justice, which is that no one is above the law. Mm-hmm. Third thing is you cripple democracy, and you replace it with crony capitalism, mm-hmm. because they're going to have so much economic power that they're going to, again, get immunity from the legal system, and they're going to get the ability, especially under Citizens United, to dominate politics and to corrupt it. So for all of these reasons, it, this has to be, in the finance world, our top priority is to get rid of the systemically dangerous institutions and to recognize that they are massively criminal institutions. Uh, hence that wonderful title you know, that uh, uh, by the uh, authors, and very conservative finance uh, scholars, who said that our most reputable banks were pervasively criminal. (laughs) Right, and this is actually set to get worse under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which wants to make it easier to move capital across borders. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is devastating to financial regulation. I mean, Citizens United was one step, but this is an even greater step in that direction. And what the people miss is the deliberate creation of the race to the bottom, right. the competition and laxity that these um, systemically dangerous institutions are able to create between different jurisdictions where they have to compete, they're told, to have the worst possible regulation so that they, the banks will locate in their countries. Right. Now, Interesting how the TPP, the trans Partnership, will also escalate the race to the bottom as well. It's a, in many ways. In many in ways. Environmental destruction, yeah, you know, so, worker it, it, rights. We just did yeah. real news, by the way, uh, uh, helped yesterday uh, with uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Jay on the trans Partnership. That's why that's, that's on our mind. Yeah. Uh, but, but, me, but there are solutions. Yeah, this, there are solutions now. But is it enough? Are you, just, are you saying break up the big banks and that's enough? Or do we have to talk about nationalization? Do we have to talk about public banks? What, what, what is breaking well, them? Because breaking them, they'll just come back if you break them up. No, I mean, you forbid them to get uh, any larger. You make that an absolute limit, that you are not permitted to be an institution so large that you pose a systemic risk. If you do that, you actually will uh, transform, uh, not just, as you just said, not just America, but the world uh, and its financial system. And you'll have full scope at that point for public banks as well. Fine, let them compete. You know, they can't possibly compete now with these too big to fail banks, but they right. could compete quite effectively uh, and did, you know, in many places for a long time. But I also caution it is no guarantee having a publicly owned bank that you won't have really severe uh, banking scandals. Right. Lots of publicly owned banks are involved in uh, public scandals for all the obvious reasons that politicians have some pretty nasty, nasty incentive structures, too. So you have to have that enforcement continues to be more impor- even more important because it's all an insider game then. Which yeah. is what I'm so, wondering. I mean, does a piece of this then have to be that if a bank fails, it fails? Oh, but absolutely. If they're no longer too big, we don't need to be so what, 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 what's big enough? How, how, what, what should the cap be? 
Well, it should be no one bigger than fifty billion uh, at a minimum. But on top of that, uh, you look for other ways that people can sometimes become uh, systemically dangerous. So sometimes they have, you know, a lock on certain areas of derivatives trades. And by the way, that's something else that needs to be fixed. It, it's just right. ludicrous that the uh, financial derivatives are getting to the point that they're ten times larger in transactions than the real economy, mm-hmm. and they're remain virtually unregulated. This is just scary. Yeah. How to produce a, dis- a global disaster? That's the, I don't right. know how if that if that crashes, that makes the hus- housing bubble look like a especially tiny. as we'll get into with the next session with Ellen about you know the way that the banks are structured so the derivatives would get bailed out first, first. before the depositors would. But um, we only have a few more minutes, and I was wondering about if you can comment on the Fed. What, yeah, exactly what I want to ask. <laughs> Should the Fed be changed? Is it yeah. Uh, yeah, more, well, the, more uh, transparent? Uh, and my colleague Randy Ray has uh, some very good stuff on specifics on the Fed, but basically um, you still need a central bank, but the central bank should be a very small place that uh, follows uh, fairly mechanical uh, rules. It doesn't really need to do all that uh, much in life, and then you need real regulators. And, And that comes through all of this. So this race to the bottom in economics, this is what we call a Gresham's dynamic, and it means that bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace because cheaters prosper. And that is our function as regulators. We have to be the regulatory cops on the beat to make sure that the cheaters don't prosper. Wow. So downsize the Fed. Is that any more transparent? Does it have to be respons- responsive to yeah, any it's democracy? Yeah, utterly transparent. There's, uh, there are virtually no reasons for almost anything the Fed does to be opaque. That's and you should get rid entirely of any governmental role with the Federal Reserve Bank's. You know the twelve Federal Reserve banks, which right. are actually controlled by the private sector. Mm-hmm. Right. It yeah, the, the Fed, that, that's one of the problems I have with the Fed. It, does, it reflects the banking system, not the economy. Well, we got rid of this conflict of interest in 1989 in the Faria legislation with savings and loans, where the federal home loan banks were structured in the same way. We said this is absurd. You can't have the private people owning the people that are supposed to regulate them. Right. That's a joke. Get rid of it. And it tells you everything you need to know, that the leadership of the Fed is diametrically opposed to getting rid of that conflict of interest. Wow. That shows you how much deeply they've drunk the Kool-Aid. Very important. So where's yeah. the best place to read uh, your work and keep up with your analysis? Because I, I find it really excellent. New economic perspectives, and if you like the more technical stuff, uh, the Social Science Research Network is where professors uh, put their academic papers. And I think on New Economics Perspective, you sometimes link to your articles on the more Technical. academic. That's correct. Uh, and so we really appreciate uh, your perspective. Uh, and uh, we'll be writing about this next week for Truth Out. We do with each of our shows, and we'll be doing a – we're trying – figure out how it, well, that will go. But our next guest will be Ellen Brown. We'll be talking about public banking with her, and we'll raise some of the issues that you raised about public banking right, absolutely. Uh, to get her responses to them. So yeah. We appreciate Thank you that. so much for taking thank time you. to be with us today. Thank you. Keep Thanks up a good break. All right. Take thank care. you. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye. And this Bye-bye. next break is a song from City Life, Bita Urbana, oh, in Massachusetts song. called The Bank Attack. The There's bank a theme today. <laughs> it's time to wake up and get with the movement. Hear the message in the music now. We can fight back or we can lay down or beat back the bank attack and stay proud. They got bailed out. We getting sold out. Some living underwater in their own house. They hear the word foreclosure. They get scared and think it's all over. But now nah, the fight just begun. It ain't gonna be easy, but it must be won. Cause Bank of America is bad for America. Congress held hostage. They kidnapped the treasure, bro. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM. WeActRadio.com. Grindstone Universal, clothing that exemplifies the epitome of urban luxury. At Grindstone Universal, our goal is to express motivating forces creatively through clothing. Our approach to quality and expression is simple. Where progress is made, truth is revealed. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at grind underscore stone. And like us on Facebook at Grindstone Universal. Also, check us out online at grindstoneuniversal.com. 
Hi, I'm Tom Morello. Some call me the Night Watchman. In the case of Mumia Bujamal is at a crucial stage. Please go to freemumia.com to find out more information about how you can help Mumia Bujamal and other political prisoners. Night Watchman out. Hi, I'm Patrick Ewing. I'm here uh, giving something back to the community. I went to school here. I lived here in the community. You know, I have an office here on Minnesota Avenue. I always loved D.C. Um, you know, just trying to give something back to the community of Ward 8 in this community or, or, or from around the country. We Act Radio, do something. Rapidly. listening to Clearing the Fog, Speaking Truth to Expose the Forces of Greed with Margaret Flowers. Kevin Zies. And the topic today is banking. Banking. And our next guest we're excited to have is Ellen Brown. She's chairman and president of the Public Banking Institute. She developed her research skills as an attorney practicing civil litigation in Los Angeles. She's author of 11 books, including a book focused on public banking, Web of Debt, which is in its fifth edition uh, in 2012. Good morning, Ellen. Oh, good morning, Margaret and Kevin. Thanks. We should also mention the uh, Public Banking Institute's conference, which Absolutely. is coming up uh, June in June in California, June second to the fourth, mm-hmm. I think. Right. Um, so, thank you for joining us, Ellen. Yeah. Okay. Do you well, start? start. Uh, yeah. y- y- why, why public banks? Let's uh, start with the big question: Why public banks? Well, today we have a situation where we have bailed out the big banks. In other words, we are bearing the losses and they are still keeping the profits. A public bank, we only have one model of a public bank in the U.S., or or the type that we're talking about, which is the Bank of North Dakota. They, it was set up in 1919 when um, the North Dakota farmers were facing situations rather like what we have today. They were losing Mm -hmm. their farms to the Wall Street bankers, and so they organized into a populist movement and um, formed the Nonpartisan League, and set up a publicly owned bank which would recycle the um, revenues of the state back into credit for the state. So th- they, kept, they kept their money and their resources and control of their money in their local community. Mm-hmm. And um, the Bank of North Dakota is now, um, th- well, North Dakota itself is the only state that escaped the credit crisis. They've had a, a budget surplus, a good healthy bu- budget surplus every year since 2008. They have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on loans, um, and they have no public debt at all. So they use their 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 bank in a way that, um, uh, well, by law, all of the revenues of the state go into the Bank of North Dakota. So then they do what any bank does, which is leverage their capital and deposits into credit. But and they partner with the local banks, so they don't actually compete with the local banks, but they they partner to allow the local banks to keep loans on their books. Um, they prov- they help with the capital requirements. They uh, buy down the loans so that the, they lower the interest rate, et cetera. So um, so it's just basically a publicly focused bank which returns the profits to the public. It doesn't have high paid CEOs. Um, it doesn't have shareholders that are demanding short-term profits. They can take the long view and do what's good for the economy in the long run. Whenever they have a crisis, like they've had a couple of large floods, the Bank of North Dakota is right there bailing out the homeowners um, or helping the homeowners, um, helping rebuild infrastructure, and there's no contest about you don't qualify for your insurance or, you know, it's the wrong kind of flood or something like that. They're actually their real intent is to help and they really do help. And so the, the basically what you're saying is they take all the uh, funds that come from taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, their, their, their payroll and all that's kept in the public bank and they leverage that money and then work to build the state. And, uh, exactly. and now they don't, they don't have, um, there's not like retail you know, uh, North Dakota public banks. Uh, people can't go on uh, the you know to their ATM machine or their they work with community banks. Is that how it works? Uh, they w- yeah they work with their local banks. 
So the local bank deals with the customer originally. Actually, you can have an account at the Bank of North Dakota, but there are only maybe 2% of their of their um, depositors are actual individuals. Mm-hmm. They, they don't make it easy for you to be a depositor. They just keep that open because it seemed like it was a public bank. They, they, it would be a good idea. But you'd almost have to live right there in the neighborhood because they only have one branch. They don't have ATMs. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes, yeah, so most of their deposits either come from the, from the state itself or they come from state agencies that put their money in, in the, ba- the bank. Right, so it makes so much sense. And, and I know there's a, a strong movement building to push for more public banks. But um, our last guest, um, Bill Black, brought up an interesting uh, point, and he was saying that what would be there to protect the public banks from scandals? From he says there are public corruption. banks around the world and that they also have corruption problems and that enforcement is still needed. And that the enforcement well, in some ways is more difficult because it's all insiders. It's politicians and they, you know, they're, they're, the bank is the part of the government and so it may make enforcement challenging. Mm-hmm. Well, there have been two, uh, two recent studies that I'm just writing on this subject on another book. And there have been two recent studies that showed that in fact Public banks are less corrupt than private banks. I mean, it, it oh, certainly great. makes sense, <laughs> and um, and that they're they're also more efficient and they're actually more profitable overall because the, the private banks keep losing money, um, which is surprising that they could be more profitable. But the thing is, they have lower costs. They don't have to advertise. They get government guarantees. Um, they can, you know, they they have easy ad- access to liquidity, et cetera. Right. So, and in North Dakota, the way they prevent corruption, they have a complete transparency, complete accountability, and they ha- they are routinely aug- audited by several different um, agencies. Or, and, transparency and is so key. Yeah, and it's today. It seems to me it is a new a new day with the internet and with that um, access to information that we have now. I mean, you could easily see where some you know, some public bank in a third world country where nobody knows what's happening in the bank could easily be corrupted and controlled. But what we don't know today is what's happening in the big private banks. And the big public banks, you can you can see every every single one of their dealings. It's all it's all out there. Yeah. Very interesting. Which brings us to our next question. Um, you've written an article recently. We posted it on It's Our Economy about Cyprus and what's happening there and the, and the real possibility of, of the seizure of deposits happening here in the United States. Can you talk about that? Well, the banks now have been required to do living wills where they, they're supposed to, the big banks, the big, uh, too big to fail, uh, where they're supposed to say what they would do in the event of a black swan event, you know, a major mm-hmm. crisis. Mm-hmm. And um, in the in the um, uh, Dodd Frank legislation, it specifically says that th- they're, they're allowed to carry on with their derivatives, but that we, the people, are no longer going to be underwriting this. The taxpayers are not going to pay. And FDIC only has twenty five billion dollars in its fund anyway. So um, uh, J P Morgan alone has seventy nine trillion dollars in derivatives. Uh, notional value, and they That's have notional over. value, not their actual investment, though. Right, but the the amount they they are the largest derivatives player, and the and the the actual value at risk in derivatives is twelve trillion Which for is all that. Big, Still much. <laughs> big. <laughs> real big. So you could easily have. I mean, you could easily envision anyway a one trillion dollar disaster. Easy. They have a trillion dollars in deposits, and FDIC fund does not have a trillion dollars in it, and the government has already said they're not going to be responsible for that kind of collapse. So in the in these plans that that the banks have been required to do, they're called bail-in provisions. They're very vague about bail-in. what they're saying, but the the plans all say that um, the the unsecured creditors will. They talk a lot about the unsecured creditors, but what they don't tell you is that. The depositors are unsecured creditors. People put their money in the bank. they never mention the insurance at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. the unsecured creditors are going to be turned into shareholders. Wow. So your debt to the bank is now going to, or sorry, the or bank your, debt your to you. Your savings becomes a share, a, a, a stock. And if the stock goes down, your value of your savings goes down. Right. And it well could. I mean, look at Lehman Brothers. Exactly. It could be wiped out totally. Right. 
Wow, you know, and Cyprus, I think, is such a crazy example. I saw an article just yesterday put up on It's Our Economy uh, uh, from Naked Capitalism about uh, how the uh, elites got their loans written off before the bank collapse, and then they <laughs> the, president. Also, the president and his family <laughs> sent their money to London before the uh, the tax on the Cyprus banks uh, went into effect. Yeah, so, so that leaves the little the little deposit. Well, the, even the if over a hundred th thousand <laughs> leaves the Russians. <laughs> yeah, but it's still like, what if you have a business? To oh, exactly. Put, that's no, where no. you keep your money to pay your employees. They're only allowing three hundred euros a day withdrawal. Well, what if you have to play, yeah. pay your workers? I mean, it's just it's going to bring the, the so. How is the public standard. banking movement going? How wh wh how how how's the advocacy working out? Well, we, there are 20 states that now have introduced legislation of one sort or another for Excellent. a public bank. We haven't succeeded in passing any. The, the one that got closest so far was California, mm -hmm. where both houses of the legislature passed the bill, but the governor failed to sign it. So mm -hmm. I think we're at the stage where we need a lot more information out there. If, if you had a groundswell of public support, that the politicians would do it. But first of all, they don't exactly understand it, and the people themselves don't exactly understand it. So if you study populist movements historically, they always start first with a lot of study, you know, where they, they all come to understand what's going on and to sort of form Right now, we have a lot of different monetary groups that are sort of competing with each other for what the real solution is, and and the tendency with um, um, pot, things that grow up from the grassroots is they compete with each other and they tend to tear each other down instead of getting together. So, so I think we're at the point where we just need a lot more information out there. I I just keep writing, 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 trying to throw yeah. more light on this subject. Well, yeah. we we do the same thing. We'll be writing about right. this interview yeah, next, you're great next week. And, and, and you have it. a blog that people can follow, the Web of Debt. Um, yeah, webofdebt.com. And, and the Public um, Banking Institute has a blo uh, website, publicbankinginstitute.org. And right. I see you've pulled up the conference. I mean, this is we're so excited about the conference this June in California and San Rafael, and June we'll be 2nd there. June second and the fourth, we'll be speaking. You have oh, some great, great speakers. Like you have some great people speaking. And so, if people want to learn more about public banking, so they can bring it back to their state and really push for that in their state, we encourage you to come uh, to that conference, and you can get a discount. If you come to use our website, it's our us has a discount available. Right, and uh, you have Matt Taibbi. Um, tell us about the conference. What do you yeah. what do you hope to happen there? Well, ag again, we first we want to introduce people who are new to this idea, but there'll also be a lot of people who who we've been hashing these ideas out for years. So, so it's so the speakers sort of vary from the introductory "What is public banking all about?" Mm -hmm. to "What can we do?" the theoretical, you know, what, what, um, and how can we progress from here, the more um, action-based. Action yeah. and, and we do have a, a man who, or, or a group that are doing, they have a computer model modeling system where we can actually show that this works. Because the, the objection you always get is that, well, that'll be inflationary or, you know, you can't do it this way because, and nobody can really visualize. It's so hard to visualize the whole economy and how things work. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you can put it into something that's visual or you know an actual model, so we're working on all that. So if you were to put forward your uh, image of a an excellent financial system for the nation, uh, yeah, for the nation, what role would public banks play in that? Well, I could see there there would be two uh, on a scale. You know, there's my ultimate vision of what it would be. But for right now, it seems to me it, what we really need is a Bank of North Dakota in every state. I mean, there is no reason why a state. Look at the states are the ones that have the big bucks in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. The states and the and the pension funds. And they've been ruined by this uh, collapse. You're you're not right. seeing you're seeing state budgets. Uh, d destroyed. You're seeing st lack of state employees. I mean, they're yeah. they're really in recession worse than uh, much of the country. Right. There's just no argument for not bringing your money back home, using it for your own purposes, leveraging it just the way a bank that or banks do, and and then if you had a network of banks, they can all share their uh, liquidity. You know, they can they could be just like the private system, but serving the public interest. No high-paid employees. Nobody gets bonuses for churning loans, et cetera. It would all just be 
They'd all just be doing their jobs. They'd get promoted for doing a good job and not for making money. Well, that's a great vision. Own. So you'd have like, you have a, a every state having a bank. You could have regional yeah uh, groups getting together to do stuff. Yeah. How does that fit into a bigger economy though? We, we're, we, we're out of time. Well, so time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, <hold on>. so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today, Ellen. And I hope our listeners will follow you. We'll write about this on clearingthefogradio.org with the websites, uh, links to the website, so our listeners can listen and. Going out with our song uh, by Junkyard Empire, yep. We Want, the people organized. Can build the kind of future we, we want. want. Thank you. This is Margaret Flowers. And I'm Kevin Zeese. Join us every Monday morning, 11 a.m. for Clearing the Fog. Speaking truth to expose the forces of greed. Start the week with your eyes open. The fog. The forces of greed that spin news stories for the benefit of the 1%. Each week, we feature guests who are working to expose these truths and offer real solutions to the current crises we face. Knowledge is power, and with knowledge, you will be empowered to act to shift the power to the people. Monday mornings at 11 a.m. on weactradio.com or 1480. This is Kimon Freeman, co-founder here at We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and weactradio.com, WPWC's Washington Progressive Working Community. Thank you for listening to a delayed broadcast of Clearing the Fog with Dr. Margaret Flowers and Attorney Kevin Zees. We now bring to you Union Edge, a 12 o'clock program already in progress.